All right. <laughs> so, so the reason we thought about working on housing was mainly motivated by this kind of striking fact. In the US, if you look at the wealth portfolios of, of households, you will, you will notice that 70% of, of the US household own a home. And then the median homeowner has housing equity at a portion of 80% of his overall wealth. Okay? So then the kind of a question that arose in our minds was how liquid is housing wealth mainly? Can households use it to smooth consumption fluctuations? So they have this big asset which most of them have access to. And um, in the same time, that's kind of like their way to protect against income fluctuations. So can they actually liquefy this, this housing wealth when, when, when they have to? So most macro assumes that housing is liquid. Basically, there are no refinancing restrictions. You can just go ahead and borrow every period using your housing asset and borrow up to a limit but you can freely tap into your home equity every period. Some guys, namely Kaplan and Violan, they argue the opposite, and um, they basically say that household own this illiquid asset. So that's why a lot of these guys are gonna be wealthy hand to mouth, namely if you give them one dollar, they'll consume it right away. A lot of them will. So what we are gonna do, we are gonna be sort of in between these two literatures. We will model key details of the US housing market We'll have housing that translates, that, sorry, that transacts infrequently. We'll also have long-term mortgages with options to extract home equity. We'll have two ways of extracting home equity, cash out, refinancing, and HELOCs. HELOCs standing for home equity lines of credit. And I'll be more explicit of what the difference between the two is later on. We'll also have a finite duration so that these guys in our model have to pay a certain portion of their mortgage every period. And we'll parameterize the model to match, you know, three kind of key sets of moments. The first will be the household portfolio composition. So we will make sure that our model does reasonably well. well. Our claim is that we do actually a good job in matching the liquid asset distribution, you know, the, the mortgage debt distribution across the U.S. population. We'll also make sure that we match the frequency of housing turnover and what is kind of like the key part of, of this paper is we'll make sure that we match the amount and the frequency with which households extract home equity, okay? So the bottom line is, in this much richer model, we can actually replicate the, the kaplan violante results, which means that we will have a lot of people that are hand-to-mouth. Namely, 20% of homeowners are gonna be hand-to-mouth. But what we try to stress is that, you know, it's, it's one thing to look at these guys that are hand-to-mouth, the other thing is, there are a lot of guys that value liquidity in this model, even though you will see that their MPC is close to zero, okay? So they, the, the main reason why they value liquidity is for precautionary reasons. They might not be hand-to-mouth this period, but they expect that in future periods, they will be hand-to-mouth. So, you know, they use this kind of, a, they save in order to smooth future income fluctuations and make required mortgage payments. So these two frictions are gonna, well, the latter is a friction, but these two motives will, will, will make them value liquidity a lot, yet they won't, if you, look, if you would look at them in, in the period when, when they are hit by the shock, they won't ex exhibit uh, MPCs, high MPCs. So why is this important? Is because if you want to design mortgage mo modification programs, you want, to, you want to understand how much people value liquidity. So think of 2007. You know, we had all these people that would want actually to have more liquid assets because they were, you know, suddenly they lost their jobs. They, there might be, their mortgage might be becoming delinquent. So these guys would actually value liquidity. And what we will be talking about in this paper is going to be a forbearance programs, namely, will allow some people to actually, you know, pay less for their mortgages for a period of time in order to make sure that these guys get the extra liquidity when they need it most. Matters what fraction of homeowners are hand to mouth, but it also matters for aggregate considerations what fraction of aggregate consumption is accounted for by these hand to mouth households. One of the key things in Kaplan Violanti <coughs> is that they argue that there are a lot of apparently high income, certainly high, substantially higher than median income households who are hand to mouth. They would classify me as hand to mouth. 
I'm, I'm not sure you, be, well, I don't know your portfolio yes, composition, but I, I suspect that you have. Assets, and that's the main way of doing it. Uh, and so that's why I'm concerned about, in your model, let's forget about them. Right. In your, in your model, what fraction of aggregate consumption is accounted for by these hand-to-mouth uh, households? So but what's the concern, Charlie? So you're saying that might be, they might be too much, or? No, no, no. If Maybe we should care just hand, about these guys. Amount, but they're all substantially low-income households, then they might account for a small fraction of aggregate consumption. Exactly. So, so, that's, so the relevant number that matters, or one of the numbers that matters, is what fraction of consumption is accounted for by hand-to-mouth households. So we, we, we ha I think we, we haven't computed that. But my kind of taste of what's, what's going on is this are still going to be guys that, as you said, we were kind of low-income people. Yeah, then, see, if, if you look at their numbers closely, yeah. especially the subsequent papers, a lot of their big effects are coming because there are a substantial fraction of very high-income yeah. households who have a marginal propensity to consume of close to one because they classify them as hand-to-mouth households is it based on their portfolios. And so they get these big effects. And I'm concerned about where those big effects. So, it's so something. A nice thing to compute. So something I think that. So, are you sure about the the the, um, the fact that they look at people who have high income? Because the way I read their paper is they, they look at your wealth. They don't care about. That's right. What I'm saying is that yes, high wealth households. I should be more. Precise. Exactly. So that's those are, important. Those are very. Those are tend to be very highly correlated. They are highly correlated, but they're not the same objects. Okay. So. Um, so my answer is, yeah, we have to be careful of how big, this, how important these guys are in aggregate consumption. Unfortunately, I don't have a number for it. Okay. But maybe it will become clearer as, as we go on in terms of how, how many of these guys are, are, are going to be. Because it's really about people who are, in, in our case, the, the hand-to-mouth people are the ones that are at the liquid asset borrowing constraint. Sure. Okay? All right, so some motivating evidence. And this, I think, will clarify some of the of the stuff that Charlie was talking about. So I'm just going to throw some numbers at you. Yeah, One really thank you. question. Uh, when you said your evidence is consistent with Kaplan Violante, are you guys also using the same liquid assets? Yes, that yes. So that's the next slide. Okay, gotcha. That's exactly what, what you were talking about. OK, so let's, let's, take, let's look at the SCF data, 2001. OK, so I'm going to look at households in 2001. I'm going to make sure I have per capita things. So I'm going to equivalize everything using OECD scales. Uh, and I'm going to look at homeowners only, okay? So I'm going to divide people into the poorest 80%, poorest 80% in terms of their total wealth, and then the richest 20% in terms of their total wealth. And uh, I'm going to look at liquid assets and housing equity. So liquid assets, we're going to follow their definition of what liquid assets are. It's going to be cash plus stocks plus bonds minus credit card debt minus any installment loans, okay? That's your liquid assets. That's something that you're supposed to, you supposedly have a lower transaction cost to actually you know, switch from stocks into cash and so on. And then your housing equity is going to be the value of your primary residence minus all debt secured by that particular house. How are how is stuff in retirement plans, like 401k plans, treated here, remind me? So, I used to know it, but I forgot. So they are completely out of the picture, precisely because they are very small. So if you look at the median guy, it's about, you know, 1,000 bucks. We know why they're very small right. in practice. It's not, because, it's, it's not because the contributions are necessarily small. It's because they tend to have very high withdrawal rates. Correct. And I also really? During the lifetime? Yes. So okay, that's something that I was not aware of. All terms offer programs on borrowing from 401ks and a surprisingly large number of households use those borrowing programs to to withdraw liquidity, basically. Withdraw, withdraw from their retirement plans, yeah. So what, what data is this based on? I don't know. We can talk about it. Right. A whole bunch of apps. No, but this is really important, right? Because it's another, this is another way of adding liquid assets to this number here. That, unfortunately, the SCF does not. Exactly. A bunch of surveys by Vanguard and Fidelity. That's, I think, your, your work, right? And I, yeah. Chris should know more about yeah. this than anybody else. 
So Chris, can you give us an idea of how big, no, 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 but look, this is going to help, this is going to help the discussion. Can you give us an idea how big this median extraction per year would be for a given guy? Uh, off the top of my head, no, but I have a paper that basically suggests um, there's a decent amount of, also in addition to what Charlie was saying, under measurement just for survey reasons in the HRS and in the SCF for exactly these retirement accounts. I see. So, uh, the, my, my guess is, and I can give you a number for that, that there's more retirement wealth than the SCF or the HRS are picking up. Okay. And right now I can't give you a number. Well, conditional on that, we can still, this thing is still going to hold to maybe to a lesser degree, but housing wealth will still be like about 70, let's say 60% of your total wealth. I think we agree that it's not going to completely ruin this idea that... No, no, that, that I think is, take, if you're looking at medians yet, yeah. well, all the rich, the rich people are the only ones. Who exactly, exactly. So, so this is actually the point of this, of this table. If you look at the rich guys, so let's, let's see how you can read these numbers, almost seven, 700. So this is mean wealth. This is going to be in 1,000, so the mean wealth of this richest 20% group is going to be around 700,000 US dollars in 2001. If you look at the composition between you know, liquid assets and housing equity, a lot of it is going to be in terms of liquid assets. So these are mainly this stuff, stocks, bonds, and so on, but primarily stocks and business, businesses that these guys own. If you look at the housing, and again, another way to look at it is if you look at the median, housing equity in total wealth, it's about half of their total wealth. Now, the interesting part is this, this particular group of people. Namely, if you look at their median liquid assets, you would, you would see that they only have like $4,000 that they can rely on. So suppose they lose a job, you know, they have three months until their mortgage becomes de delinquent in, in, in the US. That's what happens if you're 90 days, you, if you haven't paid your mortgage for 90 days, your mortgage is automatically declared delinquent. Which means that they actually, you know, if you assume that they're consuming about 2,000 per month, they have two months of consumption. Which is very little given the fact that they own a lot of housing in their portfolio, okay? So now another fact is that, you know, housing transacts infrequently. So what we are going to do is we're going to take data from the National Association of Realtors and the census and we are going to find that about 5% of the homes transact. So what I was trying to tell you previously on, on, in the table, you could see that they own a lot of housing and they transacted very, you know, <coughs> seldomly transacted. And then Bhutan and Kiss have a, have a nice paper where they look at the, at the data, you know, at the credit bureau data, and they actually are able to compute the number of people that extract equity every year. So what they find is that in, for 2001, about 12.5% of mortgage holders extracted some home equity, which is a very small fraction, right? And then not only that, but the median change in the mortgage balance when these guys did extract equity was equal to about 23%, or in dollar terms, that would be about 23,000. So our, our model will kind of try to make sure that we are consistent with all this evidence and, and get an idea of how much these guys do actually value liquidity in the end. And I'll be more specific of, of our experiment in terms of how we think of value of liquidity in a little bit. So in terms of the model, we have a life cycle partial equilibrium economy. People will be you know, born with um, certain abilities, but they will live for deep periods and then they will face idiosyncratic income shocks. They will save using liquid assets and housing. They can own or rent in this economy. They will have a fixed cost of selling their, their, uh, their house, and they will be able to borrow against the home using the two options that I talked about earlier. Dennis, can you say again just uh, how, much of the, how much is the housing equity extraction compared to the liquidity side? Like, is it a big part? Yeah, what was the? So it's, it's 0.87. So if you look at housing equity in total wealth, so basically housing equity over total wealth, the other part is liquid assets in, in, this, uh, in this summation. They have, the median guy has about 87% of his total wealth in terms of housing. But they don't always extract everything, right? Exactly. So the next figure was, if they do extract, it's going to be happening you know, almost every eighth year, if you want. That's kind of telling you this 12.5% to a certain approximation. 
or if you want to put it the other way, in a given year, only 12% of them are, is going to extract any equity. And if they do extract conditional on extracting, they're going to do actually not a lot of it, just 23,000, which is, you know, it's, it's big for, for, the, for the guy. Um, so this is median wealth for, for the poorest people, but it's not like they're going all the way up to the median wealth. All right. So preferences are pretty simple. We're going to have log preferences in consumption and housing. And then terminal um, wealth is going to be counted in terms of, you know, in the, in the last period, you don't care about housing. You just consume whatever you get. And then age is T, discount factor. And we'll put a weight, obviously, on, on preferences to, to holding or to living in a house of, of size H. We'll have no bequest or mortality, just to keep things simple. All right, so the income process is going to be composed of two, two things. The first thing will be a persistent part, Z, and then you will have a transitory component, E. And we'll also make sure that you, you have a Humpshire profile and that at retirement, you know, when you decide to retire, your income is going to go, go down by a certain fraction, lambda R, which kind of, you know, tries to simulate the fact that pension income is typically lower than the the highest income you get during your lifetime. All right. So this is pretty standard. Uh, what we will also allow them to do is save or borrow in terms of the liquid asset. Yeah? Can you go back, sorry? Yeah. So this, this initial draw of the persistent component, is that, a, does that assumption mean that you're pretty much drawing from the stationary distribution? Or? This stuff here? No, no, the one above, that one, yeah. Like yeah. the variance. I'm just confused whether the variance of incomes over, over time is, yeah. is, is, is like increasing or not. It's the same. Okay. Yeah. So we actually have some evidence that in the data, it's about the same, the, the variance from, if you look at the PSID data, variance for old people and the variance for young people is about the same. I can show you numbers. It's very hard to believe. Well, I, no, but that's, I, I'll, I mean, if you, depends on your degree of tolerance, but you'll see, it, it's, it's about the same. Remind me to go to, to the table, okay? No, no, look, we, we actually did this. We did the, we went to the PSID data, so I'm not claiming something that is out of nowhere. We have this view that variances grow over time, and if, if that's wrong, that's a big deal. Yes. Okay, so maybe I just go there directly. No, 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 no. Show no, the no, numbers. No. Go at your own pace. All right. Don't like that. Don't All right. Distract you. Okay. So in terms of housing, people can own and rent. And the house size is H, and the housing sector is pretty simple here. You know, we, 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 prices are equalized to one. And then if you, you have a fixed cost of selling uh, when, when you decide to, to, to sell, to adjust your housing stock. So, so this is kind of a, the, the, the additional part that we introduce in order to force households to save in this economy. So what we're going to have is we're going to have mortgages that are perpetuities with geometrically decaying coupons. So in, when you will see this, so the face value of, the, of this bond is, is equal to B, and that's kind of like your, your, your mortgage, and you will pay an interest rate RM, which is greater than the interest rate that you get or, or in, for, for, your, for your liquid asset. And then a fraction of the principal must be repaid each period, which the fraction is going to be gamma. So your minimum payment is going to be 1 minus gamma plus the interest rate times B. We are not going to have any prepayment penalty. So inactive, you know, will, the inactive households will basically face the following constraint. Their future holdings of this mortgage bond has to be lower than this, you know, the fraction that you actually pay in a given period. So they can actually relax this constraint by paying the fixed cost in order to extract home equity, right? Because I was telling you that earlier that they actually are allowed to borrow from their house. So we'll, we'll give them two options to extract home equity. The first one is going to be an option which we call cash out refinance, which will basically, it, it will entail a fixed cost FM times H. And you will only face two constraints, the LTV constraint, which will limit the amount you can borrow, and then the PTI constraint, which will limit the mortgage payment size in terms of your income. So you can borrow more. Then there will be another thing called the home equity loan, which will have a smaller fixed cost, FXH, 
but you will have an additional limit to borrowing. Now, the reason why we need two, two options to borrow is in order to kind of have, in order to match the moment that I was telling you earlier about where people borrow infrequently, and then we, when they do, they borrow 23,000, which is, you know, uh, in relative terms, it's a, it's a big amount for them. So this is why we need both. One way of doing it is to have two in different interest rates for them, so then they will decide to opt between the one or the other. But what we decide to do is to have fixed costs because just for us it was tractable to, to, to do it this way. And um, right, so this thing, this difference between the two actually captures the fact that if you look at the median and first Lian loan in the SEF, you will see that it's, it's close to 85,000. So cash outs are, usually, are typically larger which means they kind of, you know, larger, they entail larger closing costs. And then the second lien in the SCF data is about 17,000, so lower closing costs but lower balances. Okay? So these are the constraints that, that the typical household face. So the, the mortgage balance has to be a smaller than a certain fraction of your housing. That's the LTV constraint. And there is the payment to income constraint you know, the, the payment in, in, in a given period has to be smaller than a fraction of your permanent of the permanent component of your income, theta y. And then the limit on home equity loans is again sort of the difference between how much you borrow next period and how much you have already in terms of your debt should be a fraction theta x of, of h. Yes? So you cannot default? So this, does this somehow have an idea how it influences the results? So we don't have default in this model. I mean, in principle, the way this might, imp if you would have default, you would, you would see people ideally holding less housing, right? Because that's the thing that they can default up on, right? Mm. Can I ask? Complicated. Right. It's complicated, yeah. yeah. It's complicated, it's complicated. It's complicated. because default. default, you don't have default. The default is like the danger there. Yeah. It's interesting. And so therefore, it's like completing the market. But on the other hand, it's potentially costly. Right. And so there's one force that's driving exactly. to take on more housing. In fact, the debt is now contingent. And then there's another force, which is the interest rate has to go up. In most models, those effects roughly offset. I see. So you may be OK in ignoring it, because they may offset. But you should certainly think about including it. Right. Depends on how default happens. So default happens in so, in terms of like the numbers. My understanding is default happens like if you look at all the mortgages, it's about three to four percent of all the mortgages. So it's quantitatively not necessarily a big thing. Okay. The problem is it's particularly valuable when you have larger client income. That's the stuff that you're really trying to insure against, not right. Um, that's the stuff you've got to be careful about. Mm. It's 3% of a big number. I think you should go on. Go, go on. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is the budget constraint that renters face. It's going to be consumption plus future liquid assets plus whatever they pay for, for, their, for the rental housing that they're taking in. And then it's going to be equal to income plus whatever they earned on their liquid assets minus their, bless you, minus their, <laughs> minus the, if they, if they had a house, they would be getting whatever the value of that house is minus whatever they owe to the bank. So that's the sort of the amount that, of their mortgage debt that they hold. All right, so now when it comes to the homeowners, these guys are going to have um, a lot of things to think about because they can extract in two different ways and they also can just stay put and do nothing and just pay their own mortgage. So what they do is if they decide to purchase a new house, they will you know, pay a certain amount for it, get a mortgage. Now notice that when you get a mortgage, we allow you to you know, buy a house without necessarily getting a mortgage. So this is done in order to, to, to get at the, at the moment in the data that tells us that about 30% of, of homeowners don't have any mortgages. Okay? So we actually make sure that the model is kind of consistent with that. So I told you that there are other types of homeowners, namely the ones that do nothing. So they don't sell, they don't extract. So the only thing that they care about is that their mortgage in the next period 
is a fraction of their mortgage in the current period, which, which basically says that they're just making their mortgage payments. Then there are homeowners that decide to take a home equity loan, so they will incur this cost FXH, but they will face this extra constraint, which will tell them, you know, your, your, your new debt level, which includes this equity that you have withdrawn, has to be a certain fraction of, um, of your housing stock. It cannot go above that. So again, this is just basically making sure that these guys don't, don't go crazy with borrowing with this FX that is smaller than the other stuff, the, the FM above. So the inactive homeowners who obtain a new mortgage will basically pay this FM cost, which is larger than FX, and then they will get this new mortgage relative to the B1. With, and this part here is the old mortgage that they kind of pay, up, pay back to the bank in the moment they decide to, to lever up. Yeah. yeah. So, so inactive uh, homeowner can be paid faster than gamma Yes, yes, they can. They don't. And in the data, they don't also. So what would... In your economy, you do, people choose not to do it? No, people choose not to do it, yeah. <laughs> people yeah. Choose, not, choose not to do it. I think I had a slide on this. So maybe I... I oh, let me see. Yeah, no, it's no longer there. Yeah, so basically people choose not to do it, and, and it has to do with the difference between um, um, the different interest rates in this economy. So it's really for you, it's always about the wedge between what you pay for your uh, mortgage and what you get for your liquid assets. Uh -huh. So if we play around with that wedge, I can get some people to, to prepay faster. Yeah. Right. But what I can tell you that in the data, if you look at like... Uh, Unfortunately, there is not a lot of data on prepayments, but what you can do is some people inferred it from SCF data and some people have data from, from Citibank on literally, you know, looking at mortgages at each loan. And it's about 17 to 18% of all mortgage pay, pre, sorry, of more mortgage, mortgage holders that prepay at a given point in time. So that's a frequency statement. And when they do prepay, it's typically about 1,000, 1, 2,000 per year, which is very little compared to their mortgage balance. You're looking at this through the lens of a, of a stationary model. No? Right. So nothing aggregate changing. So no, no so aggregate shocks. Would be if, if I looked at two people who's, you know, whose interest rate has not changed, or rather if they went out of the market, they're going to get roughly the same interest rate. Right. How many of them prepay? Right. Right. Because in the data, people prepay when interest rates are cut. Right. Most of the prepayment happens in response to interest rate shocks. You don't have interest rate shocks. No. OK. So. So that was the, all the, the four options that homeowners have. So what we can do is we can write the value function in terms of what we call total wealth M, which is going to be their income, their liquid asset in the, this part in red, and then their housing equity, equity, which is their value of their housing minus the fixed cost that they would have to pay in order to sell it, minus the debt, the mortgage debt that they have on that home. All right, so for a given M and H, B basically would record the wealth composition, which means that higher B will imply liquid assets, more liquid assets, and less home equity, right? Higher B implies more liquid assets and less home equity. This part here, the blue part here. So this is important. This is how we define kind of the value of liquidity. Suppose I change this B for you. You know, suppose I give you 1,000 more um, 1,000 less in mortgage debt. I take part of your mortgage debt and I tell you that this thousand dollars, I'm going to give it to you in your liquid asset account. So are you going to be better off from this or, or, or worse off? So this is what this derivative stands for. A household values liquidity if the change in V relative to the change in B is greater than zero. And then I'm, another thing that I can ask is how much do you value this liquidity? Well, this will depend on, on how much you value consumption, right? Across periods. So the willingness of re to repay is going to be this, this fraction here. All right. Is anyone keeping track of time? <laughs> it's going to be uh, 15 minutes. 15? Yeah. OK. So let me see. Right, so this is important. OK. So. Um, who are these guys that value liquidity? Well, everything will depend on, on, on how much mortgage debt they will have. 
And you will see that there are three guys that value liquidity, namely the first ones are inactive people who make the minimum mortgage payment. So if we rewrite their budget constraint in terms of M, you know, that derivative that I was showing you earlier of V in terms of B, actually the only way, the only way that B appears in, in this particular problem is through this, through this constraint here, which means that the value of liquidity for these guys is going to be gamma times the multiplier on this, uh, on this constraint. Okay? Uh, there is another set of people that there is liquidity, which are the guys that are extracting the home equity loan. So for them, it's about the same, you know, condition applies, namely that B will only appear in, if we re rewrite the problem in terms of total wealth, B will appear only in the, in the, in the constraint here. So which means that the their value of liquidity is going to be gamma times the multiplier on, on, on this constraint, on the HELOC constraint. Okay? And then the, we, what we call the marginal homeowners are the guys that are about to sell, about to liquefy their, their housing wealth. So these guys value liquidity, but what they, they can, you know, additional liquidity gives them the option to wait, which means that I don't need to sell my house right now because I have this extra liquidity that helps me smooth consumption better across time. So they, they will save kind of a fixed cost of, of home equity extraction. So I'll get back to this free set of people in, in a little bit and I'll show you the numbers of how, how much do they value this liquidity. So basically I'll give you numbers for, the, for those derivatives. All right, so I'm going to skip that. So let's talk about parameters. So what we do is we have um, the period is one year, you know, they live from 25 to 90, they retire at, at 65 and then the income process is, uh, is based on data from the PSID. So something that we talked about Maybe this is going to explain what you, what you were uh, after. So I'm going to look at two sets of people. Age, head, head of the household means, it means less than 65. That's what I assume the retirement age is, okay, in the data. We don't observe it. And then I'm going to look at age above 65. So I'm going to plot different things. So your claim was that this stuff, the standard deviation of the income changes, is higher for, for uh, Retired people. No, 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 no. He was talking about 25 year olds versus 55 year olds. No, but is Delta Y more volatile or is Y more volatile? Y is definitely more dispersed for 55 versus 25. Right. Delta Y is what this question is about. Yeah. Right. So can you repeat no, your question? Look at, the, look at the first <laughs> column, man. Yeah. Do you yeah, believe that? That surprising. the variance of income? Correct. That's what's surprising. It's always surprising. But, but, you, but, that, but if you just add up a bunch of Delta Ys, you would expect Y for somebody who's old to be quite high relative to that. If it's a unit root, it's the square root of D. Right. So why is that not happening? And it's been documented that using PSID data, yeah. I thought that the variance in income was increasing with age. No, that's what I'm just saying. Mechanically, the no. first column and the last yeah, column uh, don't seem to add up. 65, there are either the people who oh, continue to work and like it's the ah, okay. professors okay. Yeah, 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 that's true. That make a lot of money. That's true. Too few of them. Many people who have zero, no? This right. is a very good point. Yeah, the, oh, the, okay. point, the cutoff so of 65, 65 is very important. Right. 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 If you did 45, then you'll that would probably be very different. So that's a good point. It's something that maybe we should go back and check how robust this stuff is depending on how much, you know, where I cut the data, basically. But that was the point, right? Because people typically assume that these, this initial draw for, of this persistent component right. draw from a different than the stationary distribution. Yeah. So that right. um, you get the fanning out. So, so this is probably so this. All the guys who hold mortgages are people in their 40s, not people in their 60s. So that's why that break is not that helpful. The, want to do the 65, you mean, right? The 65 yeah. break yeah. is not helpful. You should do uh, breaks or something more convenient. What, what was that? Is that? The 65? 10 minutes. So look, is that the number that you were after, the mu zero? So what we do is we make sure that we, we calibrate that that in order to get 21% increase from, from age 30 to age 35. No. But you are after the second exactly. moment, right? Is after the variance. Yeah, variance at age 30 and variance at age 50. Okay. If you look at that, yeah, you no. see a lot. Yeah, 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 you should. Your process is going to give it. You right. have a near yeah. unit root. And exactly. You have a constant no, variance. No, no, no. But he draws, he draws the initial draw from the stationary distribution of that near unit root process. Because yeah, yeah, this one here. The near yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. Okay, so we have to check that. That's a good point. 
All right, so in terms of the interest rates, we are going to set them. We're going to set the mortgage rate equal to 2.5. That's going to be based on data, you know, for 2001. This is, this is where you're ignoring default is a big deal. Because that uh, should show up in here. Because what you should really do is, if you are doing this approximation that says having a model with default and having a model with no default, I should just look at the actual resource costs associated with that. You should reduce that RM by the default property. Right. Right. No, it has to be adjusted for the risk of default. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So something that we should consider. Um, we have the, the interest rate on, on liquid assets, which is going to be the three-year T-bill, you know, similar to, Dave, to Davis et al. Oh, no, but that's not right for, for, the, for so, the households that's in the top 20 percent. No, but we ignore those guys. So oh, yeah, those guys, exactly, yeah, yeah. So I should have mentioned that. That's my, my, yeah, my the bad. The point of Kaplan Violanti is it's, there's a whole bunch of those guys. Because otherwise, you don't get big consumption multipliers in the aggregate. No, so I think I, that's where I disagree with you. Okay. If you look at their data and what they do with the data, they actually throw out those guys, too. So the, the super, okay, right, super wealthy people, the super wealthy people are not liquidity constrained. Full stop. Because I showed you the numbers. They have like 500,000 you know, in assets. If you believe those guys are liquidity constrained, then maybe they are, but we don't. We, we, we disagree on that. OK, so the mortgage contract, we're going to pick some numbers so that we, rep we replicate the data, namely that you know, typically in the US, they have access to 30-year mortgages. And that's what usually they have you know, in the SCF data. And we'll make sure that the LTV constraint um, is such that the upper tail of SCF data on LTV is so that we match the upper tail of the SCF data on LTV. So we look at the data, and then we set theta m equal to 0.92 in order to get at the 90th percentile of, of LTVs in, in the data. And the PTI constraint is going to be equal to 0.35. So your mortgage payments will be equal to 35% of your uh, monthly income. And that comes from, from Greenwald. Um, so it's, it's based on, on, uh, on, I think, on HDMA data on loans. All right, so we're going to calibrate some things. The parameters that we choose to calibrate are the fixed costs, the discount factor, the limit on the home equity loan. This limit enters that borrowing constraint that I was showing you earlier, the preference weight on consumption, and then the rental rate on housing. We are going to match certain moments. You know, We're going to play with these parameters in order to match these particular moments. So we do reasonably well if you compare their to model. The only two parts that we we are not that good at is matching the aggregate mortgage debt to income and aggregate liquid assets to income. Okay? So do you get the age profile of the home ownership? So let me, maybe I can, I think I had it somewhere. I, I'm not going to show you the average age profile, but I can show you kind of the, like the, how the, um, there you go. Kind of like how the life cycle looks for a particular guy in this economy, OK? So this is the income that you will face, yeah. potentially. So you, if you want to do the average, just draw. Smooth, smooth this stuff out, OK? This is your consumption. And this is the housing that, uh, decisions that you will face. So you will get this stuff. Now, unfortunately, we can't address the comment that, that Chari had on a previous version of his paper, the fact that you know, in the data, if you look at the data, People don't just uh, sell out of their house, you know, as as they age. They, typically, you have a, like a flat line in terms of home ownership, right? But we do have this, you know, increasing home ownership in the, in the early age. Can you just help me smooth out the liquid assets? Like, should I smooth it out by they go to zero at age 60, or? No, 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 no. no. If they would go to the average value that I was showing you. Oh, you mean at, in retirement? Yeah, yeah, in retirement. I, I just I worry that the, the assets are dropping like a rock and that they don't so much. In the data, yeah, yeah. So that's something I, they, they have to draw because of this stuff, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. So what they're doing is they will increase at points when the guy sells the house. So this part's here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right? This is when the jump happens. And then they increase again when you, know, you get closer to retirement. But should we take the jump seriously? Is this one simulation? Or no, this is one simulation. This is yeah. not the average. That's what I told you. But it kind of gives you an idea of what's happening with, uh, with, uh, with the average part. So I don't have that many slides. You shouldn't be so worried. It's just that's the appendix. All right. So what do we get in terms of the parameters uh, that we ca calibrate? Um, so the fixed cost of 
selling a house is going to be equal to 0.6, the, uh, the fixed cost of obtaining a mortgage is 0.5, and then the fixed cost of extracting home equity is going to be equal to 0.02. Okay? Now this we have data on. It's, it's about what you see in the data. You, know, you would lose about 6% of the value of a house when you transact the home. This stuff we don't have data on, but what you should, so we kind of use the model to infer what, what these fixed costs are, and what they should tell you is that it's kind of costly for the guys to, to, to extract home equity, okay? So these costs are pretty high. If they were closer to zero, these guys would be you know, allowed to extract home equity as much as they want. Okay, so this is something that I'm gonna skip, but you, know, you can trust me, we do it reasonably well in terms of matching some other moments that we haven't targeted, namely the liquid assets distribution, the housing size distribution, the LTV, and then the share of housing in total wealth. All right, results. So there's one result that I want to talk about. Remember I was telling you about this derivative. So it's, it's, we have a lot of non-convexity in this model. So what we can do is we can calculate it based on this this discrete changes in, in, in the size of your mortgage. So this will kind of motivate our experiment. So what is this experiment? So you have two types of assets, housing equity and liquid assets. So what I can do to you if you are a homeowner, I can tell you, suppose I increase your your mortgage balance by a certain fraction delta B, which let's say it's going to be equal to 1% of your home value. Suppose I give you 1% of your home value in your mortgage balance account, okay? <coughs> I can report how much are you going to value this stuff by the fact that I actually liquefied some of your wealth. So let me repeat that again. So suppose I give you $1,000 in cash, but in the same time I increase your mortgage by $1,000. Nothing has changed in terms of your overall wealth because you owe me a thousand in the mortgage account, but you in the same time in your in your you know in your kind of in your on your card you get one thousand dollars cash. <coughs> so how much would you value this transfer from your mortgage debt account to your liquid asset account? And what's going to happen to your consumption when you receive this this particular transfer? All right. So as I said, it's going to be the value of this transfer is about one percent of the home. So the fraction that benefits is equal, is, so about 70% of the guys like that, okay? And then how much do they like that? They're willing to give 10, 10 cents back to me for every dollar that I give them, okay? And there is obviously variation in, in, in terms of how much they're willing to give back, but the idea is a lot of them value this liquidity and they value it a lot, namely they're willing to give back some of the money in order to receive this extra dollar of, of liquid wealth. Where? So this is percentiles. I look at the distribution of how much they are willing to give back. I might expect that to be decreasing if like the poor guys value it more, but it's not. No, 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 no. This is not in terms of the percentiles of uh, income. This is in terms of the percentile of this particular valuation of liquidity. See what I mean? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, the mean is 10.2%. The median of this distribution yeah, yeah, yeah. is 68 Okay? So now, who are these guys? So as I told you before, some of them are going to be hand to mouth. So what we find is, out of these guys, the 70% that value this liquidity, you know, 25% are going to be not marginal and hand to mouth, which means that they are not about to sell their house or to, in order to liquefy their wealth or get or want to get a, a, a home equity loan in order to liquefy their wealth. And any, any dollar that you would give them, they will just consume it right away. Okay, and then their median valuation is going to be equal to 19.1% of whatever the value of the transfer is. The important part is that there are a lot of guys that are not marginal and not hand to mouth, namely they're not at their liquid asset constraints. So they're, you know, they can, they have some liquid assets, but they still value consumption. They just don't value, sorry, they still value this transfer. You, they just won't consume as much as these guys. So basically in the first period, they, you won't see any changes in their MPC, but with, with what kind of should tell you that they value consumption, they, they value it as much as they're going to give five cents back if I give them one dollar. So maybe this graph will help you understand better what I'm talking about. So on the left side you have the hand-to-mouth guys, on the right side you have the non-hand-to-mouth guys, and then the, the x-axis is the period after this injection, we call it a liquidity injection, the transfer from your mortgage balance into your liquid asset account, and then on the y-axis, you have the change in consumption relative to the change in, in BT. 
So if you look at, and these are kind of intervals sort of plotting the distribution. If you look at the hand-to-mouth guys, they consume everything in the first period. If you look at the non-hand-to-mouth guys, basically nothing, almost nothing will change in the first period. So, you know, if you, if you want to take this to the data, you shouldn't be surprised. And if you believe what our model holds true, you know, if you see some guys that have no changes in their MPC when you throw a dollar at them, you know, that doesn't mean that they don't like this dollar. That just, does, that, that just means that they, they are not going to consume it in the first period. But look at what happens in the periods thereafter. So these guys kind of have the belief that they might become hand to mouth. So they save that dollar in that first period. But in the second period, they have less risk. So kind of the, they already know the income in their second periods. And they know that they will live for you know, 65 minus 1 years. So then they start consuming parts of it. So if you look at what they do is, in, these are periods after the injection. And this is how the, cum the cumulative fraction of people who actually consumed 50% of the transfer. So the vast majority of them will, will have consumed 50% of their transfer by the fifth period in time. OK? Something funny about that. When you integrate that out, that should be one. That, that should be zero. No, no, no. So, so this is the important distinction. Is the fraction of people, right, half race consumption C by at least 50% of Delta B. No, but I'm interested in the aggregate thing because I haven't done anything to the overall asset position of the economy. I right. Reclassified it. So these guys, in any economy where the present value, where the budget constraint has to be satisfied, eventually you've got to cut back down their consumption if they increased it early on. That's why this exercise. No, 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 because they avoid this fixed cost of, of, of getting this extra liquidity. Ah, that's what they avoid. Yes. Them. So then the savings should be equal to their fixed cost amortized appropriately. Right. That fixed cost is that big for these guys? Or maybe it's at 0.5. You should go on. I don't, I don't understand this calculation. So ignore that then. Just focus on this. Maybe this is a bit more straightforward. If I... This I understand. This just says after period four, it's basically zero. Zero. But I'm still surprised. So the, all the gains from period zero to three come from avoiding the fixed cost with positive probability in future years. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <coughs> All right, so that's basically it. I want to summarize. You know, a large fraction of homeowners are liquidity constrained. They're better off with more liquid. Oh, OK. So I have actually, how much time do I have? Can I talk about this? Zero. OK. <laughs> so what you can do is, now I'm just going to tell you what you can do. What you can do is, if you believe that these guys are liquidity constrained, you should care when you design this mortgage forbearance program. So what these things are is typically, uh, in the US, if you, if you are about to go delinquent on your loan, what banks can do is that they can lower your mortgage payments as a certain fraction of your income. So we actually tried that, and it turns out this, this, pro this type of uh, mortgage modifications programs don't have a bite because you are not helping out the guys that are most liquidity constraints and those are the guys that have a lot of housing equity so mean, it means that they have actually very little mortgage debt so those are the guys that value liquidity because all of this housing equity is such a big fraction of their their total housing sorry their total wealth okay thank you any questions